We're finally ready to revisit the Vertex Algebra series, and here we're gonna look at what is maybe the simplest non-trivial vertex algebra. So we've looked at commutative vertex algebras in past videos, but those are kind of trivial. They don't, they don't have any of the interesting structure that good examples have. But before we do that, I wanna go ahead and recall the definition of a vertex algebra, sometimes a vertex super algebra because we're using a superspace here. So a vertex algebra is a vector vector superspace V, which decomposes into a direct sum of V0 plus V1, where these are like even vectors and these are odd vectors. And if you have a sum of an even vector and an odd vector, then that's neither even nor odd. So it's non-homogeneous. And then together we have infinitely many bilinear products. So in other words, if U and V are in V, then we can multiply u and v infinitely many times and that's indexed by the integers and we put it like a subscript of the left object so here this is red like u sub n v and that's going to be an element from v so it's closed under these infinitely many products then next, we'll want something called a vertex operator, which takes all of those infinitely many products and bundles them up into one object. So we'll use the notation y, v, z. So z is a formal variable here. So we've got the sum over all integers of v sub n, z to the minus n minus one. So notice if you multiply that onto another vector, like maybe you could call it u, you would have some sort of formal power series that contains all of the information of the ways of multiplying v with u. And then we've got some axioms. So the first axiom is called the vacuum axiom, and that says that there is a special even vector which we'll denote by this one, and it has the following properties. One sub n of v is just delta n minus one v. So in other words, the nth multiplication of this vacuum vector is equal to zero unless we're at n equals minus one. And then next, v minus one on the vacuum equals v, so this is called the creation axiom sometimes. So this creates the vector v, and then vn on one gives us zero for all n bigger than or equal to zero. So this is some sort of annihilation condition. Okay, next we've got something called the translation operator. And so that's gonna be a linear map from V to V. And it satisfies the following rule. If we operate onto a vector and stick it inside the vertex operator, that's equivalent to taking the formal derivative of that vertex operator. Okay, next we've got something called the truncation condition. So that says for all u and v in v, there exists a natural number n such that if n is bigger than or equal to capital N, u sub n of v is equal to zero. So good, and then that's equivalent to something that's a little bit easier to check, which is called locality or weak commutativity sometimes. And so that looks like z minus w to the nth power and so that n comes from the n up here. And then we've got this commutator or super commutator, depending on where the vectors come from, of y, u, z, y, v, w, and that's gonna be equal to zero. So these vertex operators, sometimes known as fields, don't commute, but they are local in some sense that if you multiply them with this power of a binomial, they will end up commuting in some sense. Okay, so here in this video, we're gonna look at something called the Heisenberg vertex algebra. And in fact, we're gonna look at the rank one Heisenberg vertex algebra. And you know, I'm not a physicist, but from my understanding, this is some sort of algebraic model of one free boson. Okay, so let's see the parts that we really need to build. So we first need to build the vector space. So that's actually gonna be quite a bit of work. But then after we build the vector space, we have to build these infinitely many products or this vertex operator and then check all of these things right here. So let's get to it. Okay, so we're gonna start with a one dimensional vector space and we'll call that H. And so we'll say it's a one dimensional vector space and it has a basis vector of alpha. So I'm just gonna write this as C times alpha. And then just notice that this is like a fancy way of writing a one dimensional vector space with basis equal to this single vector alpha. 
Okay, good. Then the next thing that we're gonna do is view alpha as an abelian Lie algebra, and then we're gonna form the affinization of alpha. And that's sometimes called alpha hat. So any vector space can be thought of as just some trivial Lie algebra where the Lie bracket is given by just zero for all of the vectors. So that's what we're thinking about for alpha here. And then we form the affine Lie algebra related to this H. And so that's gonna be H hat. And exactly what is it? So it's gonna be H tensored with Laurent polynomials. So that's polynomials in T and T inverse. And then we also need to add on one more vector, which is central. And so like I said, this is the affine Lie algebra or the affinization of H. And this is like kind of a gnarly construction, but as you'll see in the end, we will have something that is pretty concrete to put our hands on and that you could almost like skip this construction if you understand what we've got our hands on at the end. So it's actually pretty easy to write down a basis for H hat. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So a basis of H hat. So that's gonna be given by alpha tensor T to the N as n is running over all integers. And so that's because we have a one dimensional vector space up here. That's why we only need one type. You can kind of see what would happen if we had two dimensional or a three dimensional vector space up here. But then we need to union this with this central vector. So that's our basis of a chat. Now we need to talk about the commutation relations. Up here, it was a trivial commutation relation or bracket relation, but down here, it's a little bit more interesting and it goes like this. So we have alpha tensor T to the M bracketed with alpha tensor T to the N. So this is gonna be equal to M times delta M plus N comma zero and then this central vector K. Like I've been saying, this vector k is central, and what that means is if we take k with anything x from h hat, we're gonna get zero. In other words, it commutes with everything in h hat. Okay, good. So let's maybe do a couple of examples of this happening. So notice if we take alpha tensor t squared and alpha tensor t to the minus two, like that, well, that's gonna give us two and then delta two plus minus two comma zero k. But notice two minus two is zero, so that just gives us two times the central vector k like that. Okay, good. And then maybe like we could do one more example. So if we do alpha tensor t cubed and then alpha tensor t to the minus five. So that's gonna be zero and that's because three minus five is not equal to zero. Okay, good. And now let's maybe go ahead and introduce some notation, which is gonna be super helpful as we move forward because we actually don't wanna write this alpha tensor T to the M um, all the time. So here's what we'll write from now on. We'll write alpha tensor T to the M will be written as alpha of M like this. And just if you're kind of thinking ahead, you wanna think that this is gonna be alpha sub M. Although generally for the Heisenberg vertex algebra, we put them in parentheses until of a, instead of a subscript over here, although it will correspond to the products that we subscript in the precise definition. Okay, so we've got our first step building the vector space out of the way. Now we're ready for the second. Okay, we formed our affine Lie algebra H hat on the last board. It had the following basis after we fixed our notation of alpha of n, where n is an integer, union this central vector k. Now we're ready to build this into the vector space that will eventually become the vertex algebra. So we're gonna take a one dimensional representation of part of H hat. And so let's take, we'll call that one dimensional representation C1. So you can see where we're going here. This one will eventually be the vacuum of our vertex algebra. And like I said, this is gonna be a one dimensional representation of Let's say it is the following Lie subalgebra of H hat. I'll write it like this. So it's going to be the span of alpha n, where n is bigger than or equal to zero, and 
this central element. So it's the span of those two types of vectors. So not the negative modes, but the non-negative modes. Sometimes this is called h hat bigger than or equal to zero. And it's kind of understood that this vector k kind of lives inside of that like that. Okay, so if we've got this one dimensional representation, well, we really need to talk about how these vectors act on the generator of this one dimensional representation, which is given by this one or this eventual vacuum vector. So we're gonna do that in the following way. And this is like, pretty simple. So we're going to have alpha n on one is equal to zero. So as you can see, in this setup, we have n bigger than or equal to zero. And so we want this alpha n to kill what is going to become the vacuum. And so that's like building um, this rule right here. Okay, great. And then we want to ask, well, how does k act on one? So k hat acts on one in the following way. So there's like a bunch of ways to do this. In fact, infinitely many ways to do this, but generally it's by k times one where k is just any complex number. And generally if you take k equal to zero, it's not super interesting. You just get back to a commutative vertex algebra, which we saw in a previous video. And so you'll want to take k non-zero, but for k that is anything non-zero, you can renormalize the whole thing so that it is isomorphic to the algebra created when k was one. So that's exactly what we're going to do from here on out. So we'll take k equal one, and that doesn't ruin anything. Okay, good. And now we're going to finally build the thing which is the vector space, which will be our Heisenberg vertex algebra. And this is like some sort of induced representation where we induce this one dimensional representation of this h hat bigger than or equal to zero up to a representation of the whole h hat. Now that's a really fancy way to write it. And as you'll see, when we write it down, it will be kind of fancy but we'll have kind of a too long, didn't understand the heinous calculation on the next board, which will bring us back to something a little bit more concrete. So here's what we wanna do. We'll wanna set, now there's a bunch of different notations for this. So I've been using this calligraphic H to call the vector space for the Heisenberg vertex algebra, but some other people use things like this v sub h like that or m one zero but i've been using this calligraphic h but like i said it doesn't really matter but those are some other notations okay so what is this going to be well we're going to take the universal enveloping algebra of this affine version of h so of this h hat and then we're gonna tensor that, and we're gonna tensor that where we're allowed to move all of these things past the tensor product, um, and that's given by the subscript of the tensor product. So again, this is like kind of fancy, and these are um, u h hat bigger than or equal to zero. And then we're tensoring all that with c1, like that. Okay, so this is a bit hard to look at, but what does this look like in the end? So elements of H look like this. So I'm just going to give some like straightforward examples of elements from H and then we'll like go back to the top of the board where we summarize what we've done so far. So maybe like this, so alpha minus three, alpha minus two, alpha minus one, one. So that would be an example of an element from H. Here's another example, alpha five, alpha minus three, alpha minus five, alpha two, alpha minus one, one. So you really want to think about this as just polynomials in infinitely many variables. And those variables are giving, given by alpha of n, where n is like going over whatever integer you want. But then there's non-commutativity. 
But the fact that we're doing this all from a universal enveloping algebra means that we know the commutivity rules and those commutativity rules are built from the commutativity which is in H hat. So let's maybe go ahead and explore that a little bit more in the next board. On the last board, we got done constructing our vector space, which will eventually become our Heisenberg vertex algebra. I called this the calligraphic H, and we motivated the fact that it's really the span of monomials of this form. So we've got alpha M1 all the way up to alpha M sub K, hitting this thing that will become the vacuum one, k is bigger than or equal to zero, and then mi is an integer. So notice if k is equal to zero, we just have the vacuum. So the vacuum itself is in h. But then if k is bigger than zero, then we've got some bigger monomial. And I wanna point out that we think of this as being generated by a single vector alpha. And what I mean by that is this whole vector space is really just made up of alpha multiplying to itself all of the different possible ways that are described over here. Okay, great. So now we wanna look at some examples and actually simplify this a little bit. Not simplify this side, but we'll simplify some rules over here. So here's an example of something inside of H. So we've got alpha two, alpha minus three, alpha minus two, one. But I claim that we can put this in a better order. And the order that we wanna put it in is some sort of decreasing order, or maybe it's an increasing order, but with only negative modes. But here we've got a positive mode. So let's see what we can do for that. Well, notice we can take this grouping and replace it with the following thing. So with alpha minus three, alpha two, plus the commutator of alpha two with alpha minus three. So notice that when we're inside this universal enveloping algebra, this bracket alpha two, alpha minus three is equal to this alpha two, alpha minus three, minus alpha minus three, alpha two, so that means we can make that replacement. So let's maybe go ahead and point that out real quick. So that's because alpha M with alpha N is equal to alpha M, alpha N minus alpha N, alpha M. And that's inside of H, or it's really inside of that universal enveloping algebra, which is being used to build H. Okay. Good, but notice that we know that this commutator is equal to zero because these two numbers don't add to zero if we recall the commutator that we had a couple boards ago. So that's equal to zero, which means we can commute this with no cost. So let's do that. That'll give us alpha minus three, alpha two, alpha minus two, one, like that. And now we're gonna play that same game again, just moving everything to the right as needed. So I'm gonna group this, and let's see, we can make the following replacement. Alpha minus three, and then we'll have alpha minus two, alpha two, plus the commutator of alpha two with alpha minus two, and then over back here, we have the vacuum. But notice we know something about this. We know that this commutator is equal to two times our vector k. Now we can let everything act on the vacuum. So notice that's gonna give us alpha minus three, alpha minus two, alpha two on the vacuum. So that's from this first term. And then next we'll have plus two alpha minus three uh, times K on the vacuum. But then we know that alpha two on the vacuum is zero. By some earlier discussion, how we constructed this H from that trivial representation of the non-negative modes of alpha. So that gives us zero. And then K hat on the vacuum gives us just the vacuum, one times the vacuum, or K times the vacuum if you didn't set K equal to one, but we might as well set K equal to one. So notice here we get that this is two times alpha minus three on the vacuum. 
Okay, cool. Now, I want to point out that this actually has some nice structure related to what we have at the beginning. Notice that this is equal to 2, and then the partial derivative with respect to alpha minus 2 of alpha minus 3, alpha minus 2, 1. So these positive modes, this alpha 2 is acting like some sort of scalar multiple of a partial derivative of the negative mode. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna give you guys a little homework exercise, and that is to simplify the following monomial so we can put it in the right form. So let's say it's alpha three, alpha two, alpha minus four, alpha minus two, alpha minus three on the vacuum like that. So simplify that until it's in the right form. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and get rid of this and then we'll jump on to the next step. Okay, on the last board we argued a simplification of our vector space which will become our Heisenberg vertex algebra. So it was the span of monomials of this form, so alpha m sub 1 all the way up to alpha m sub k on the vacuum where k was bigger than or equal to 0. And then like I said, we argued on the last board that we could order these m's in the following way. So m1 is less than or equal to m2 is less than or equal to m3 all the way up to mk which is less than or equal to 1. We gave an example which is easily extendable to a general case that we don't need non-negative modes and so notice we had like an alpha 2 and we saw that that canceled out in some way and then I gave you a homework problem with some other things that would cancel out in some way and then furthermore if we've got negative numbers in here we know those things commute without any sort of rule at all which is why we can put them in this order. So I want to point out that in the precise definition we use these subscripts and if we wanted to write this in the same way, well, it would be alpha sub m minus 1 would be this alpha of m minus 1. But I'm just using the parentheses because that's a lot more standard when you're writing elements from the Heisenberg vertex algebra. Okay, so now I've got a definition and a theorem. I won't prove the theorem in this video, but we probably will in the future. But it's going to be extremely helpful in order to prove that this is a vertex algebra. So we say that V is generated by a subset S if every element from V can be written as a span of elements from S, which I have as V upper I, that have been combined together with any of the infinitely many uh, bilinear products that are defining the vertex algebra. Okay, great. So like I said on the last board, this tells us that under this definition, this H is generated by just alpha. Or maybe we could call that alpha minus one on one, but we'll say that those are the same thing. Okay, and then we've got this reconstruction theorem that says if S generates V, so it generates V just as a vector space, so we could write everything inside of V in this combination of terms from S. And then we also know that all of the elements from S have this locality condition. So that's just all of the elements from the generating set. Then V is a vertex algebra. So here all we have to do is check this locality condition on the generating vectors and then we'll know that the locality condition holds on the whole vertex algebra. So that's actually going to be extremely helpful. Okay, let's maybe go ahead and get rid of this definition and this theorem, and we'll check that this H actually defines a vertex algebra by checking locality. Now we're ready to check that this Heisenberg vertex algebra is actually a vertex algebra. So I've stated it as a theorem. And that is, this calligraphic H is a vertex algebra where the generator alpha minus 1 on 1, which we often think about as just alpha of Z. So in other words, that plugged into the vertex operator is equal to just something which we'll call alpha of Z, which is in turn equal to this sum as N goes over all integers of alpha N z to the minus n minus 1. So that's going to be our vertex operator. And then more generally, 
a vertex operator of a standard monomial here where I've actually shifted these so I have the condition where all of these mi are bigger than or equal to zero because I've set them negative and taken away one. So that fits in with the condition up there. So that's gonna be equal to one over m1 factorial all the way up to mk factorial. And then this kth fold normally ordered product, look in a previous video for the normally ordered product of the m first derivative of alpha so that would be like the m first derivative of this guy with respect to z all the way up to the m kth derivative of alpha so again that's the m kth derivative of that thing with respect to z okay so we've got the vertex operator defined the vacuum i haven't written down what it is but it's just this vector one that's not too hard to check and then finally we've got this Tra translation operator defined as follows. So T evaluated on alpha minus M one is gonna be equal to M alpha minus M minus one one. So it sends you deeper into the algebra. And then you extend this as a derivation. So it follows some sort of Leibniz rule or product rule like from calculus. Okay, so now let's go ahead and check locality. And by the reconstruction theorem, we only need to check locality on the generator. And there's only one generator alpha. So in other words, our goal is to find some number n, which is a natural number, such that z minus w to the n, um, and then the commutator alpha z alpha w is equal to zero, where alpha z is equal to this thing up here, like I had earlier said. So it's not too hard to kind of play around with it, and you'll see that the n that works here is really just two. So let's maybe go ahead and do that calculation. So we've got z minus w squared, and then alpha z, alpha w. So alpha z, alpha w. So let's maybe go ahead and expand that out a little bit. So that's gonna be z minus w squared. And then we have a double sum both over the whole integers. So this is gonna be m and n in z. And then the commutator of alpha m with alpha n, z to the minus m minus one, and then w to the minus n minus one, like that, okay. So again, the commutator of these two fields or the, these two vertex operators turned into a sum of these two commutators, which these are actually just happening inside of H hat almost, if you wanna think about it like that. That's where we get that, those commutation relations. Okay, good. Now we'll want to apply the commutation relation. So this is gonna be equal to Z minus W squared then we'll have the sum over m and n integers. I'll just write it as m comma n. And then this is gonna be m delta m plus n comma zero. And then we have z to the minus m minus one, w to the minus n minus one. But the fact that we have to have m plus n to be zero in order for this Kronecker delta to not disappear, that's gonna reduce our double sum to a single sum. So what do we need here? So we need n to be equal to minus m for this whole thing to survive. So let's see what that gives us. So I can do the same thing, but I'll replace all of my n's with minus m's and then I'll have just a single sum. So I've got z minus w squared, and then the sum over all of the integers m of m z to the minus m minus one, and then w to the m minus one, like that. Okay, so now what do we wanna do here? We'll multiply out that binomial, distribute it through to that sum, and then do some re-indexing tricks, and then we'll have it. So this is gonna be z squared minus two zw plus w squared. That's obviously multiplying that binomial out. And then we've got this sum as m goes over the integers of m, z to the minus m minus one, w to the m minus one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that product. That's gonna give us this sum as m goes over all of the integers 
of m and then z to the minus m plus one. And then we still have w to the m minus one. Okay, and then multiplying this minus two ZW through, that's gonna give us minus two, and then the sum over integers M, M, Z to the minus M, W to the M, like that. And then finally, we'll get this thing from multiplying W squared through, so that'll be plus the sum as M goes over all integers of M, z to the minus m minus 1, w to the m plus 1. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and bring that last step up and then we'll finish it off. We ended the last board at the following spot. So now we're gonna re-index this first sum and then this last sum, and then we'll be good to go. And why the first and the last sum? That's because this central sum has a nice form already of just z to the minus m, w to the m. So that's what we wanna turn this power of z and this power of w into. So let's see maybe how we can do that. Let's take m and replace it with m plus one. So, that's gonna change this guy right here to be a sum. Well, it's gonna be still a sum over all integers because that's a doubly infinite sum. So we don't have to change the starting point or the ending point because there is no starting or ending point. And then we'll have m plus one, z to the minus m, w to the m. So that's what that changes to. Okay, and then we'll do the same kind of thing here, but we'll replace m with m minus one. That's going to turn this thing into the sum. Again, over all of the integers, we don't have to worry about re-indexing the starting or the ending point. And then we'll have m minus 1, z to the minus m, w to the m. Okay, good. But now we can notice that this thing and this thing add up to exactly that, but without the minus sign, which tells us that this, this, and this all add up to zero, which is exactly what we wanted to show to finish off this proof. Okay, so maybe we'll stop this video here, and in a future video we'll do some more calculations with monomials inside of the Heisenberg algebra. That's a good place to stop.